Hello there, everybody. Today we are back with yet another bonus round table performed by the crew and the cast of Team Bonus Action. And today we are going to be discussing the topic of DMing. And with us today, uh, this is your host, Luxall CV, a.k.a. Frecky V. Uh, we have three other people with us that are a member of our cast that also DM. Um, and if you would like to introduce yourselves, how about we start with Knox? Go first. I am not a people. I am classified as a meat popsicle. Fair enough. <laughs> and uh, how about Kalum? Uh, that's me, Kalum. Uh, currently play in the Lost Seas game as Gleam. All right, and last but not least, Miro. Hello, to Miro Knox. I'm classified as a small SUV that's illegal in certain countries because of emissions. <laughs> Fabulous. All right, so today we're going to talk about some of the topics for what it's like to DM, some of the experiences you've had, and things like that. So to get us kicked off, I wanted to start with kind of a basic, what, it's a multi-point system here. What was either your first experience DMing, if you remember it, um, and what led you to want to start DMing, and around what time was that? And so we'll go ahead and go in reverse. Mira, what, Mira would you like to start us off with that? Uh, let's see. The first time I ever DM'd was actually using the uh, Exalted system because uh, I didn't have any of the D&D books. And the, the main reason I ran it is we had a buddy of mine that was always our DM for either Pathfinder 3.5 or uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse or Exalted. And then he just kind of stopped doing it and we wanted to keep playing. So it kind of ended up being me. I kind of fell into the role of forever DM because other times uh, folks would say they want to play and it'd be months before a game ever even got mentioned as happening and then one session and we're done. So I kind of just fell in to fill the gap. And so about when, about how long ago was that? How long have you been DMing? Um, since 99, 2000. So, oh God, that's 20 years. <laughs> You're a veteran. <laughs> well, no, I just feel like the end of Saving Private Ryan when you see Matt Damon become an old man in the cemetery, just saying that right now. I need a minute. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, Knox, what about you? What uh, what was your first experience DMing or, you know, why did you want to start? When did you start? That type of thing. I always, like, and from the first time that I heard about d and I wanted, I wanted to play. Uh, but it wasn't exactly something that was really available and around where I grew up. So... I just didn't. And then it was uh, <sighs> Moose when that had been 2016? So somewhat recent. Good. The first time you DM'd was way before 2016, at least with me. There was that fourth ed game with you and the group. Uh, Dude, that was, was like ten. That was like ten years ago. Was it? Yeah, that was yeah, a long I guess time ago. Been, that'd have been TC more. Did, than that. TC was, didn't it, even it, live with y'all yet. So it'd have been more. It probably would have been more than that. Uh, but so I say, and, and so I, what got me kind of back into it was I, and I actually, I was working for, um, a, a, a major national cable provider, uh, who shall rename, who shall remain nameless, but sounds like a penis joke. And I was looking for podcasts to listen to. Uh, and I came across, and I came across a podcast called Critical Hit, 
Uh, it's from the Major Spoilers Podcast Network. Uh, they are uh, pop culture, comics, all kind of nerdy stuff. And they started around about three months before I started listening. They started doing a, a live play podcast of, of a game specifically for the podcast. And they were playing fourth edition and I started listening to that. And the longer I listened to it, the more I wanted to play it. And so we just, so I, so I, I found I just bit the bullet and was like, all right, I got, I, I found all the resources that I needed and was like, okay, I went online. I grabbed a cup. I grabbed like the first three, uh, canned campaigns for fourth edition for lower for like from essentially from level one to level five and just got a bunch of people to go around the table I'm like all right you fuckers are playing dnd now let's go and we've been playing ever since off and on that so it's probably about 10 10 to 13 years so yeah and we just and we have continued and then eventually we eventually kind of fell off and life kind of got it in a way as it always does and then and then here we are now yeah uh <laughs> started playing we started playing in fifth we started playing fifth edition oh god <laughs> about five or six yeah. about five or six, about five or six years ago in our, in our home game now, it had been seven years ago, about seven years ago, in our home game, and then I got invited by DM by Miro to join in on the online game, and thus Team Bonus Action was born. Exactly. All right, and Kalum, what about you? Once again, first experience DMing. Why did you want to, and when did you start? Uh, my first experience. I do not remember what the name of the game was. It was similar-ish to Cyberpunk. Um, I want to say that was probably in the year 2000. I had a friend who was trying to run a game, and he was just not very good at it. He asked me to take the place. So he took my character, and I took the place of him and that didn't last super long we played maybe four or five games and then because i was doing that i also also used to play these things called muds which are it's a video game though and then my friend steven who Knox knows um was like hey we're playing uh dungeons and dragons if you want to play that and so it turned into a thing where like steven would dm a game and then the next game i would dm and we just swapped back and forth. And I played 3.5 with Steven and that group. Kind of co-DMing for a long time. And that pretty much how I got started doing it. Very fair. Also kind of a older DM as well. Because that was back in 2000 when you first started. And you said it uh, MUDs. The MUDs, can you explain a little more on what those are and how they kind of related? They are like text-based adventure games. Um, it it kind of depended on the flavor of the mud. Um, it was like you would... The very minimal graphics were ASCII-based and it would mostly say like you walk into a dark room and you would type in like look around and stuff like that. So a lot of back then... My DM style was literally ripping off muds that I played. I would just follow their story beats, just straight plagiarism. Which kind of makes sense, though, because with those text-based games, it's kind of one of the first games where you genuinely could try whatever you wanted, which I feel like is kind of the distinction between like a video game and a tabletop game, especially something like Dungeons & Dragons, is you can try whatever you can really think of. It may or may not work. It may not be an option you have, but it's at least worth a shot. All right. So 
This is going to be a little bit of a sappy one. What do you love most about DMing Knox? You have to pick just kind of one main topic out of everything that you enjoy about DMing. What is it that you love the most? Playing D&D. I have a tendency to get distracted when it distracted or forgetful when it comes to my character. DMing forces me to play all of the characters. So it's always it's always something there's always something to focus on. So I have a tendency to I have a tendency to keep my uh, keep my focus. There's a lot less there's a lot less information that I have to that I have to remember as far as characters go and it allows me to just that, that having the, just such a broad scope to be able to play with a lot of little, a lot of little characters instead of one big one. Uh, and it allows me to kind of flex my create the, 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 the creative writing uh, bone, which is, which, which I don't do nearly as much as I should because I'm actually not, I'm actually not, not terrible when it comes to, like creative writing and stuff like that. I just don't because I'm lazy. Uh, I mean, I've been, I've, I've been published twice, but I still don't (laughs) because it's it's just a matter of me sitting down and sitting down and doing it. So it it lets me kind of flex that muscle when it comes to a, when it comes to a, a homebrew campaign, especially. And then when it comes to a can campaign, I don't have to think. Everything is there for me. It's okay. This is where you are. What do you want to do? We want to go here. Okay, I got to go to this page. Okay, this is where you. This is what you find. What do you want to do? It it takes a lot of it takes a lot of the the, the strain and the headache because I mean you can ask either one of, of these guys. It's it, it, to plan uh, a two hour game. A two hour game takes about four hours worth of prep time on a, uh, when when you when it comes to homebrew. Because you got to figure out what happens, and then you got to figure out, and then you have to figure out what are these idiots going to do. <laughs> Not only put, what happens, but what could happen, basically. Yeah. What? Okay. What are these idiots going to do? And then once you figure out what you want them to do, then what the idiots are going to do, then you plan a third thing for when the idiots go completely off the reservation. What's going to happen? Like if. If they go here, this is going to happen. If they go here, this is going to happen. If they go anywhere else, this happens. So it, it, there's a lot of prep time that goes into uh, into a homebrew campaign. Uh, Pre cans, just picking up one of the books like you know, and for five, you like Curse of Strahd or Dun- uh, Dragon Heist or stuff like that. You, you pick it up and it's sitting there in front of you. There, this is where the characters are. What do they do? If that it's a uh, very much a choose your own adventure style of play because it's okay what do you want to do we're going to go over here all right cool i'm going to go to this page and this is what happens next and i'm guessing too kind of with uh you were saying like the ability to focus is a little bit better when you're able to kind of care less about everything about a character versus kind of the more of a general situation so I would assume one of the benefits of being a DM too is like if you create an NPC that just doesn't end up driving, you can kind of drop them. Or if you end up creating one that ends up being really good, that especially the players end up liking, it kind of lets you delve a little bit deeper into that character in particular. So you still get a little bit of the role playing aspect, not quite as much as a consistent character that you run throughout the campaign, but it's a little bit of best of both worlds for that type of thing. All right, absolutely, because you can have a you can have a character that if they if that they don't respond to or they respond the wrong way to, uh, then you can have some you can change that on the fly and have it to be something else, or you can have a, 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 a an NPC that they really really like and then play him as the captain of a pirate vessel with penises painted on the side of it for three <laughs> or for four years. Yep. All right, uh, Kalum, uh, to you on this one. Um, what is your favorite thing about being a DM? Um, I guess I got a few answers to that. One is more so what I enjoy about 
playing games like this in general, which is just whether you're in person or online. I really just like hanging out with my friends. And but my mind always I feel like I need to be focused on something all the time. And having a game helps me focus on that on something so that I don't get super distracted. At, God, you're a messy drinker. Um, sorry, that dog was <laughs> slobbering on the bowl. Um, it, it lets me focus my mind on something to where I'm not getting easily distracted. Um, another thing is I, I tend to overthink before I say things. So I, I either don't say anything or it's a very, I guess, concise sentence or it might not come out concise, but in my head it is. And when you're DMing, you have to kind of go with the flow a little more. And it, it pulls me out of my own head because I have to react instead of plan more often than I end up reacting more than planning. And I feel for me personally that that's a healthy thing. And I'm just like being a, a dumbass sometimes and you get to be <laughs> get to make a million characters and, you know, you can have 10 of them be a dumbass. Kind of more like, I guess you could compare DMing a character versus playing a character as an actual player to like improv versus a stage show. Like you're you're much more on the improv. Not saying that playing a character you're not, but you have more guidelines, I guess, as a consistent character that you play throughout a campaign. But if you're a DM, you have to have a little bit more flexibility and thinking on your feet and just kind of let it go where it ends up going. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and you'll you'll find from you'll find at times and it's amazing it's it's and it's scary sometimes it's really weird how at times uh, the dice will tell the story like legitimately like you have it in your head all right this happens this happens this happens well this can't happen unless unless the the players botch this or unless they get really high roll on this and or you, or there's just a, an open-ended situation, and then the players end up rolling either horribly or exceedingly well enough where it causes something to happen that just builds on the story and makes the story better. And I think that's one of the things for people who don't really understand what D&D is and they're trying to learn. That's one of the aspects that is kind of hard to explain is so you can do anything you want, well, technically you can try, but the dice are going to be what decides whether or not you do what it is that you want to do. I, I also personally, as a player at least, love when dice the dice roll screws me over. I love that. I love to fail in games like this. And so what I do if my players fail at a roll is I make it seem... Like, they almost succeeded, and, like, you know, you know, they didn't just miss the monster because they're the hero of the story. You know, the maybe they hit their first attack and the second attack. Maybe the person before them hit, and they, like, like winced in pain, and that's why the next person's arrow missed. I try to make them... I like to do that, too. I like to make them feel heroic, I guess. So it's not like, ah, oh, you missed, moving on. It's like, oh, uh, well, you know... Nox stabbed him in the stomach and he winced and your arrow just just barely missed because he didn't calculate for that. And so it makes it seem more... I like to make them feel better about things. Like, I, I really like that part of DMing as well. Absolutely. And then Miro, now, for you, same thing. What would you say is your favorite thing? Uh, my favorite thing with DMing is when you actually see the player's get really excited or really into what they're doing to where they get lost in the moment because that lets me know I've done my job at that point. But also, the whole thing we're supposed to be doing is allowing a little bit of escapism, just a little bit of a, you know, two to three hours, which is normally where our games run on the long end, uh, to escape every day, and especially this year with uh, Cousin Ronnie around. It's... Uh, people need an escape and if they can have that moment where when you say okay how do you want to do this or okay that's a critical success describe to me exactly how you pull this off 
and then they really get into it. You see that spark of creativity, that spark of happiness or joy. And sometimes you also see that it's really what someone needed that day because they've had either a shitty day or hell, a shitty eight months. And that moment right there, that joy, that spark is just wonderful to see. It's the reason like, uh, with like Kaloom saying, I'm much more reactionary. I do a lot more improv. There's loose bones to what's going on. Because sometimes players, when they get into the groove, they have an idea a thousand times better than what I was going to do. You know, the, the old joke about it's a warehouse. Y you mean it's someone who turns into a house on the full moon? Yes. It wasn't before. It is now. That's actually the perfect lead up because that was something that has now been mentioned a couple of times. So I want to touch on that. Uh, for you, Miro, what is a time that you can remember, if you can remember, where a player has inadvertently like made a decision for you like that? Like, what would you say has been one of your favorite times that you maybe you weren't even expecting? Like, you know, this is obviously going to go this way, and then something just threw a wrench in it, and you had to fly with it. Were there any particular instances that you've had like that? Uh, one of the most recent ones is actually Zeta Reticuli uh, playing his beautiful half-elven, half-orc fighter, flirting successfully with a vampire in mid-battle to gain advantage on an attack. So he actually successfully was able to fluster... He, the vampire? Yes, he was able to fluster the vampire, who is now kind of a frenemy, but the, the vampire didn't get any of their names, which is also a wonderful moment when one of the party members goes, he swore his vengeance as he phased through a wall. Hey, he never got our names. <laughs> Other side of the DM screen, internally screaming. Uh, <laughs> let's see, another one is, you know, oh, they killed a dragon. We're resurrecting this son of a bitch. We now have a taxi cab system. I'm like, well, there goes every encounter in the wilderness I was going to schedule for you. Hey, Just... I, I, I legitimately cut that campaign down by like three episodes by doing that. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> so, I mean, that that was a great one. Or, uh, let's see, what's another good one? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, you, Frecky, leaning really into the I've gotten poisoned by rabies, I'm going to kill the rest of the party. I mean, yeah. I wasn't trying to. <laughs> I apologize. Or I'm going to have sex with the devil to get drugs. Uh, Kogo, t Kogo is a lot more impulsive than she is nowadays. I apologize for that. <laughs> All right. On that same topic, uh, Knox, was there any particular time that you can think of where you just had that wrench thrown in and you weren't expecting it, but it ended up working out for you? Uh, or I guess for the party? <laughs> I can't really remember one off the top, off the top of my head, uh, but I can pretty much guarantee that it was probably either uh it was probably either misha krista and probably krista honestly because krista comes from who's one of my players in my home game uh krista comes from she's one of our best friends and she she comes from a theater background and she, she'd never played she'd very 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 D&D is not something that would ever have been on her radar until she started hanging out with us. Uh, and I finally taught and I finally talked her into playing. And when we started this 5e game and she she rolled she rolled up a a paladin and it's the and I, I think I think Miro can it can back me up on this for sure. It's the experience of Having someone who has never played the game before, knows nothing about the game, sitting down at the table to play their first five sessions when they have no idea how anything works 
that's when you get inventiveness because yeah, they don't much. know how it works. So they, tr it, it, well, what do I do? You can do whatever you want. Okay, I want to do this. Holy crap, I've never thought about doing that. And it's just simply because as a as a D and D player, you know how the game works. So you're thinking you're thinking about it mechanically instead of thematically. And when you have someone who has never played the game before, they will always they will pretty much always approach it thematically before they'll approach it mechanically because they don't know the mechanics yet. So they're there. I, I, I want I want to do this. I want to go talk to this kid over here. OK. Well, it's a it, it's a little be it's a beggar child. So he would have. So were you around? Were you were you around here when this when when this fire got started? Huh? Yeah, I guess he would have been. You know that 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 kind that kind of thing. Now that also does lead into the whole thing of the guy in the corner. Uh, you know, he's describing the tavern, and there's a there's an old guy by himself drinking a beer, and he got a guy standing at the bar banging a machete, saying, "I'll kill the next time Mister walks in this door." And the party spends the next four hours convinced that the goblin in the corner not bothering anybody drinking his beer. Who doesn't even have a name um is the most important npc in the game i've definitely heard of cases like that where someone that was supposed to be like a throwaway npc or just like a very minor minor thing happening even a an object sometimes i've heard the dms <laughs> going like the party just gets obsessed like this has to be something and then the dm you kind of have to make a call you know is it something or is it not? And I guess sometimes it can be something. <laughs> or does he get drugged by the party all the way through into becoming a noble? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> and then, uh, Kaloom, what about you? Any times that you've ever had a major wrench thrown? Um, so, years ago, my friend Brad wanted to play D&D. And uh, so did my friend Cody. They had both never played before. And I was having a lot of trouble finding other players. And I was like, I don't really want to run a, a two-player game. So Brad was like, well, I'll have my kids play with this. And at the time, his youngest didn't. Um, the, two po the two boys did and the older girl did. They were probably a little bit too young um, at the for the very first game, um, we were playing 3.5 and I was running a module based out of like, it was based around Krishinabin, which is like kind of Drist and Wolfgar type stuff. And there was, when they got to town, basically like three different things happened, but they only had time to make one choice. And so they made their choice and then they wanted to find out more information about it. So they were going around to the different shops asking people questions. And they went to one shop that I was like, this woman will not have any information at all about this. Like, sh she doesn't have any information. They went in and my friend Brad was really threatening her. And he rolled okay on his um, intimidation. And then as he was talking, his oldest daughter, she was playing a halfling sorcerer, and she said, hey, can I reach the uh, the blinds? And I was like, sure. She said, as he's starting to threaten her, can I close the blinds and make it seem scarier? And I was like, absolutely you can. And then I gave him a plus 10 on his intimidation for it. And then now, all of a sudden, because I didn't want to disappoint her because it was such a a bold move for a... At the time, she was probably 13, 14 years old. And I was like, I don't want to punish her for this. So the woman gave them some information, even though I had made up my mind previously that she does not have any information. And then another time, we were playing 5th edition with the same group, but the kids were a little bit older now. 
and one of his sons had been being kind of a bully in real life. And they were at a bar and there was some people just kind of eyeballing them. And I was going to have them eventually be like a another adventuring party where like sometimes they work together. Sometimes they were after the same quarry. So they might have to like race them to something. And my friend Cody, his character wanted to go up and talk to him just to be like, hey, why y'all keep eyeballing us? And I was going to have this whole conversation of like, you know, y'all have been taking a lot of jobs from us and stuff like that. But the the boy went up. He was like, I want to go with him because he was one of those like wherever anybody went, he was going to. And so he went and I had them being a little bit sassy. And he looked at me and he's like, I want to spit in his face. And I was like, what? He said, I want to spit in his face. And then I did the classic DM thing. Are you sure that's what you want to do? And he said, yes. And so an entire bar fight broke out where Brad had his character just sit at the bar and never get up. Just drinking his coffee at the bar. Because he said that's his fault that he this fight is happening. And the entire fight, they didn't attack anyone except for that boy's character. They attacked no one else but him. And he was getting really upset about it, which it was kind of a lesson, but also I didn't plan on there being a bar fight. But he's, I was like, if I was sitting at a bar and I was just kind of looking at somebody because I was a little upset they were taking work from me and he walked up and spit in my face, I'd want to fight him. And so that whole storyline just went away because they ended up killing all of the little NPC group that I had. And so I had to, I pretty much ended the session right there because I didn't have anything, I didn't have anything not including that group planned ahead. So I was like, okay, well, we're going to end it there because, you know, I had, I had a rough time last night and I couldn't prepare very much. But that's well, it's just, a good life lesson. <laughs> yeah, plus it was a little bit of a life lesson for the kid to, you know, don't be a butt. <laughs> All right, uh, Kalum, we'll just go right back to you. Um, for other DMs, what are like two or three tips that you can think of that you personally have discovered that you think would be really, you know, helpful for someone who's DMing? And it can be anything from like literal gameplay stuff or how to manage like your players versus managing your characters. Um, what is something that you could give as advice? Um, I'll say w one, it's important for you as the DM to have fun as well. Because if you're not having fun, your players aren't going to have fun. And the whole goal, you know, you got to remember you're playing a game and games are fun. Another is don't, don't take yourself too seriously. You know, like it, it is like hurting cats sometimes, but you're, hopefully playing with friends or people you're friendly with and if they get off topic a little bit let it happen but eventually rein it back in and uh i don't know i'm very hard on myself when i dm sometimes so i have to remind myself not to be hard on myself because a, a lot of the stuff i'm hard on myself on that they won't even remember that they're gonna remember the the cool stuff, you know, and the the stuff I'm hard on myself on is like the minutia in between that. And I don't, let let your players have fun. If they do something crazy and ridiculous, let them do it. And if they succeed at it, awesome. That'll be a ten years from now. They'll be telling a story about that one time when they were playing D D and D or whatever game, and they did this really cool thing, and it was freaking awesome. And that's. That's what you remember. You don't remember, oh, well, I tried something and I couldn't do it, so I don't know what happened. And just little little things like that. You know, just it's fun. Have fun. Remember it's a game. I'd say that's pretty fair. Uh, Nox, what about you? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of along the same lines. Uh, you, you are. It's Ultimately, remember that it is a... It, it is literally you and your friends sitting around a table telling a story. Uh, 
with certain aspects of it randomized for flavor. Uh, whoever the play, the players are specific characters in that story, and the DM is literally everybody else. So he is just the DM is just there to flesh to flesh out to flesh out the rest of the world and to to, to hold the camera up to, uh, to hold the can the the characters are the movie, the DM is the screen. You are there to give him somewhere to go. Uh, also, unless you know. 100% that the people that are sitting around your table are the most dedicated character actors on the planet. Your game, and I say this with 100% certainty, will never be as serious as you th- as you think it will be or will want it to be. Because it will, ne- they will never, it will never <clears throat> fail. Somebody will try to seduce the bad guy. Someone will try to steal from try, someone. Uh, the bard is going to attempt to steal from the magistrate as he's giving you the quest to save the village. Your and ranger, the- your ranger will throw a witch in an oven. Your ranger will throw a witch. Will throw a witch in an oven. Uh, the your playing the curse of Strahd. The party will witness a hag attempt to steal a child, and will then spend the next forty-five minutes threatening the parents because they allowed it to happen. That's very fair. Expect the unexpected. What, what you want to happen, the story that you have in your head, uh, it's not going to happen that way. Like, <laughs> of course not. It's it's not going to happen that way. And, and come to terms come to terms with that the minute you buy the in the minute you buy the dungeon the minute you decide I'm going to buy the dungeon master's guide. Come to terms with that. It is never going to work the way you want it to. It will work. Trust me, it will work. But it, you cannot plan out they're going to do A, B, C, D, E, and F. Yep. It's got to be they're going to start here. Somehow I got to get them here. Eventually they need to make it here. The second point is when they learn who the bad guy is. The third point, uh, the third point down the road is with their first encounter with the bad guy, and then the fifth point down the road is the final battle. <clears throat> know the overarching storyline of wh- of the the high point, the cliff notes of what you want the party to do, and then f- figure that shit out on the fly how to get them there. If you need them in a certain town so that they can witness the big bads burn it down, let them role, especially if you have a, a, a deep role playing party, let them role play until an opportunity provides itself during a, while they're shopping, like, Hey, do you have? Uh, do you have? Uh, what kind of what kind of wands do you have for sale? Well, I don't have any, and it's I don't uh, I don't have any right now. Uh, the next town over, uh, I usually get them from a uh, from an artificer uh, an artificer there. If y'all make your way there, he'll probably sell you also. That kind of thing. Let it happen. Let it happen. If you let it happen organically, you will not be disappointed that the way you wanted it to happen didn't work. Yep, you just kind of make sure that it fits in in some way and just be prepared to make changes. And then, um, Mira, what about you? Do you have any two, three pieces of advice? Oh, I'll just kind of echo the first thing is uh, don't marry yourself to a storyline. I made that mistake early, early on DMing. Just focus on having some good bones for whatever you're going to uh, have as a story or 
make something more episodic that, you know, okay, I want them to have more of what they're doing right here. So occasionally have it there in a dungeon. They can pick whatever dungeon they want. There's multiple ones they can get to. Some of them might take multiple years to get to, especially if it's someone's sister involved. Okay, I feel personally attacked. <laughs> uh, but the other thing is, and uh, everyone that's in this podcast right now uh, can probably agree with it uh, from my style, is lean heavily into the absurd. Do something just goofy and off the wall to make your party think. Like, introduce an awakened badger who works at a wizarding school that made sentient poison ivy for some reason and has already sold it so you got to keep it alive but now you're dealing with little bushes that just make you itchy they can't really attack you or hurt you but they can sure make your day terrible so now the party has to think of how do i catch these things and not catch poison ivy or from the same game have all of a sudden the vegetables in the kitchen awaken none of them have big hp none of them have great big attacks but you still end up maybe with a party member getting slowly choked by a chain of garlic on the wall. Just so that the party then has to stop and think. Or the goblins, they're not bad guys. They're just goofy. You know, go fun with it. Or heck, name something like Billy Gob Thornton or Gobby Hill because that gob just ain't right. Just do something funny and goofy that can bring some levity to the situation because it's never going to be serious. I mean, uh, to quote another meme, everybody goes in thinking they're going to be Lord of the Rings and runs out like they're running away from the rabbit in Monty Python's Holy Grail. I mean, that's the situation. You know, everybody wants to be drist, but in reality, nobody is. Someone's going to make a fart joke, or the rogue's going to do something that's going to ruin everything, or the bard's going to literally try to seduce a rock because they're bored at that moment. My solution to the last one is later on in the party or later on in the game, you have a stone golem that shows up that looks very similar to the bard. <laughs> in that same vein, um, and it may kind of be what you've already said for all of you, but what is something that when you either first started DMing or first started like thinking about DMing, what do you wish that you'd known? And I do feel like this probably is going to tie back into what y'all have just said as far as the make sure you had fun with it, be flexible. Like like you said, Nero, don't go in expecting Lord of the Rings because you're going to come out running away from Monty Python. Like, what is something, though, that you wish that maybe you'd known to save some headache or some heartache with your earlier campaigns? So we'll start with uh, you again, Miro. Well, the big thing is, is like I said a second ago, don't get married to a storyline. Uh, if you want to do that, write a story. Write a book. Don't don't try to have your friends go through a slightly interactive fiction. Because it's not fun. Thinking of a great NPC, thinking of a great all this, all that, that's fantastic and that's wonderful. And that can really add to the experience for your players because it becomes more immersive. But... They're always the stars. They're always the focus. Never never let the story take away from their experience and what they're doing. And that was the biggest rookie mistake I ever made. Other than not thinking that math was hard. So keep a calculator on hand. <laughs> well, nowadays, everybody's got a cell phone, so... That, that exactly. every, everybody's always got, okay, hold on. Let me, I got to total this up real quick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kaloum, what about you? Is there anything for, uh, for new DMs or something that you wish that you'd known early on? Um, so I'm, I know Knox definitely knows this. But I'm sure the rest of y'all know it as well, but I am a freak when it comes to learning rules in games, it doesn't matter what game it is. I will know them inside, outside, forward, backward. I, I just become obsessed with rules. Yeah, he really is a walking PHP. And I, and I, and I, I literally, that, that, that's the reason why he has been in, uh, he's in my games. Especially at the beginning when I had a table of, nine players 
five of them had never picked up a never picked up a d20 before i needed i what i needed was i needed a somebody i needed a fixer i needed a ringer i needed somebody who i could hand three players off to and go help them i'm going to get these i'm going to get these i'm going to get these four and as as good as that is though when you're a dm you you need to have a good understanding of the rules but it's okay to just throw them in the trash can sometimes and the the first few games that i ever dm'd i was so strict on the rules and it it just like once again it's a game have fun and when you're so strict on the rules it cuts a lot of fun out and then i realized my players aren't having fun because i keep shutting them down and so that's also just having some insight into realizing if your players are having fun or not and then adjusting from there or even after if you start a new campaign with people you've never played before it's okay to take you know 10 15 minutes after a game and ask them hey did you have fun what did y'all like what didn't y'all like because then let's say you have a like he Knox had not nine players at the table you know, two of them might really love role playing and not give a damn about combat. Four of them might love combat and not give a damn about role playing. So you want to focus. You want to kind of weave and and everything between all of that stuff because if you're just going combat, 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 your role playing players aren't going to be having fun. But if you're just doing role play, role play, role play, your combat players aren't going to have fun. But you're allowed to weave in and out of that or even things like skill challenges kind of weave the two of those things together where there is no combat but the combat players are going to like it because they have to think on their feet and things like that but it also the role playing players will like it because they're allowed to be creative and just figuring out what your players like I wish I would have known that earlier I think that's very fair um, and again, it does go back to having fun, but it's good to kind of give these specific, like, here's ways to keep this in mind to let your players have fun. Um, and then Knox with you again, something you realized or wish you'd realize sooner about DMing. Run it like a video game. It, 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 I, I wish I would have thought about this a long time ago, uh, especially when I was writing and you know, when I, when I was writing my own homebrews. Uh, mainly it, make it modular like okay these these are the, the um, you write five different events that can happen not as an outline but as five separate things and trigger them like cut scenes in a video game like literally have it have a situation where it, it this will happen if they go here, here, or here. This will pop off. What that does for you is that gives you that gives you a box full of scenarios. You at the beginning of the game, you pull four, you pull four scenarios out, and you set them in front of you. You let your character and you let your players start playing. They're going to get to a point where you go, okay, I can pull this scenario out, and you drop it in front of them, and they have to deal with it. They finish that. They go on. They don't touch. They don't go anywhere near the second or the third scenario. You drop the fourth on them, and that's the end of the session. You then take you then take scenario two and three. You put it back in a fucking box, and next session, they are still there for you to be able to use. At that, if you think about if you think about DMing in that way, as a modular as a modular system of encounters like a video game cutscene where once you where you can run around this building all you want but if you go into this door the cutscene's going to cutscene's going to trigger if you think about it like that what happens is you end up building yourself an arsenal of things that can happen that aren't necessarily that aren't necessarily tied to each other but can be with a little bit of tweaking that you can do on the fly 
And then if and then at that point, when the players throw you that curveball, because they will. While you're not prepared for it, you can modify something that's in that box to pull it out and go, boom, this is what you did. Uh, because you did that, this is what you're dealing with. Would you mind if I jump on to and add on to that real quick? Yeah. Um, another thing, too, is if you think of like, man, I see this monster in the monster manual that I really like, but it's a, an undead and I wish instead it was a monstrosity. Great. Make it a monstrosity. It's now a monstrosity. Just reflavor things. It's it works just as well, and your players won't know or even care, and they'll just think it's cool. To kind of <laughs> also tag in on that, the number of times I've used the stats of a young adult red dragon and just rethemed it is ridiculous. I was about to say, from just some of our experiences with, like, you know, the, the different games that, you know, we have Lost Seas and, like, uh, the ARS game and everything, like, that seems to be what you do specifically, too, is the reskinning of something to make it fit either, like, a different locale or a different scenario and things like that. It's, my thing is, is that D&D gives you a huge set of Legos. And they give you directions on how those Legos should look, but I might not want it to look that way. I might not feel it should be that way, so I take a Drake. Next thing you know, it's an undead aberration using a lot of the same stats. Instead of doing acid and slashing, maybe it does necrotic and force, which then starts messing the party up a lot more, And it, even though it's a low challenge rating creature. It I like make, that. It makes the party think more than uh, just like, oh, I know what this is. I can fight it this way. It also breaks down some of the meta that some people might throw at you uh, if you do random one-shots at a game store. Guilty as charged on that one. I've definitely had moments of like, this is supposed to be this, and then I look it up and it says something different, and then I have to remind myself, oh, nope, Miro's DMing. It can be whatever he says it is, because he's probably already had it reskinned to something else. All right. Um, for the last question now, this is uh, from the point of view of a DM. What is advice that you want to give to your players? So something that directly relates to DMing, like maybe you want to ask them to give you like, you know, a little bit of forgiveness about certain things, or maybe you want to ask them to, you know, participate in different ways. What is something that from your experiences as a DM, you wish that the players knew about what you do and how to make things either easier for you, more fun for you, or more fun for them. Um, and Miro, we'll just go right back with you. Uh, can you think of anything for that? Just fucking try it. Like, don't... I, I, I'm fine, and sometimes as a DM, you get a little bit of a laugh when you know what's in the room is a giant duck. All it is is a duck the size of a small cow. And it's actually not dangerous. The party is now going to have a delivery slash fetch it quest for returning the giant duck. But they're outside the door for 30 minutes, terrified of what's in it because you have scared everybody about doors for the last, I don't know, 10 sessions. Sometimes that's funny, but after a while, just try it. Do something. Have, fuck it. Have fun with it. I mean, worst case scenario, you roll a one and we describe something funny that happens. Best case scenario, you open up and you realize all this contemplating is a duck. Again, like I said, lean into the absurdism, but just to anybody that's at my table, if you got a wild idea, if you got something goofy, try it. Because 90% of the time I'm be like, yeah, all right, let's see how this rolls. Because I think I'm going to also laugh at this. So this is going to be awesome. I like that. That's some good advice. Uh, Knox, what about you? What would you say to the players? Read the goddamn room. That's a good one. If you are, if you build, if if you build a noble and selfless 
space knight with a laser sword, <laughs> do not spend four turns of combat attempting to use your order's brand of telekinesis to physically shove one bad guy literally up one another bad guy's ass. Hey, I was there for that. You were. Read the room. You want to do something silly? You want to do something stupid? By all means. If it, if after, if after, if after a little bit, nobody's into it, drop it. Doesn't matter if you think it's hilarious. If nobody else, did, if you tell a joke and you're the only person in, and you're the only person in the room laughing, it wasn't a good joke, dude. Would you say that that theory kind of works both ways, though? Like, let's say you have a party that is enjoying a scenario and maybe doing either a bit of unwinding or trying to take more of a diplomatic take, but then you have someone that's trying to be very serious and round everybody up. Does that apply in reverse, too, with the read the room of maybe listen to what your party is trying to do versus just what you want to do? It does not, and I'll tell you why. Being stupid in a room full of serious, stupid always thinks it's the greatest thing on the face of the planet. Being serious in a room full of stupid, you know you're the only person that's serious. That's a good you way to know. put it, actually. Being stupid in a room full of serious, you think you can win them over. Being serious in a room full of stupid, you know you've already lost. Very fair. All on right. That, on that point, if you find yourself serious in a room full of stupid, especially if it's a group that you've been playing with forever or for a long time, don't get mad. You knew what you were getting into. If it's a group that you just started playing with, suck it up and deal with it, and you ain't got to play with them again. D and D D and D and role playing games have gotten to a point in the past five in the past five years. It is not hard to find a new game. That's very fair. Um, Kalum, for you, what would you say for your players? Sorry, I was uh, figuring out how to unmute myself there. Um. I don't just once again just have fun like with the two things that Miro and Nox said as well you know sometimes your brand of fun isn't fun for other people and you have to it, figure that out and it doesn't mean you're having fun wrong it just means you're have you're maybe having fun with the wrong group of people um but also, if if you don't like something, and you, let's say, something came up in the game, and it related something to ha that happened to you in real life, and you, you don't like going in, you don't like dipping your toes into that water, tell your DM. Tell them that. And yes. if they're a good DM, they will drop that. They will, okay, we won't do that again. And... You know, just having good communication outside of the game with your DM is a, is important. And if if I ran a game and you acted like you were having fun, I would continue with that kind of stuff. But if you weren't actually having fun and I didn't know that, I would continue doing that. And I, as a DM myself, I like my players to tell me, "Hey, I didn't I didn't like that stuff." And okay, cool, we'll try to avoid that and it's just communication is important and it goes both ways as well you know dm to players and players to dm and you know if something makes you uncomfortable tell the dm if one of the other players is making you uncomfortable definitely tell your dm and it's just you know communication is key and and i can I, I, i've seen way too many i've seen way too many things on reddit and online of 
people recounting, oh, I didn't, I, I stopped playing D and D for X amount of years because this game group that I was in for five years, this happened every single time, and I can I cannot stress this enough. Just like Kaloon said, if something happens in the game that makes you uncomfortable, talk to your DM. A good DM will drop it. A bad DM, you need to drop it. Exactly. And also, I guess, to kind of just, excuse me, uh, jump off of that is my advice, because I've seen this too many times at the game shop. Um, don't be that guy in a game. Like, if, especially if someone has told you personally that what you're doing makes them uncomfortable, don't be that guy that keeps doing it. Have some wherewithal, just like Knox said, read the room. If what you're doing as a player makes other people uncomfortable, stop and think, what am I doing? Because, and maybe this is just me, I'm not really having fun unless I can also see that everybody else at the table is having fun. So don't be the guy that steals someone else's fun. And exactly. To to add on a little bit more to that, the uh, if a if a player has a problem with another player, but that player is not comfortable bringing it up to that player, me personally, I'm the type of just person that if that player came to me and said, "Hey, you know," if Knox was like, "Hey, I'm I'm having a lot of problems with Miro." I don't have a problem going to Miro and telling him, hey, cut that out. I understand some people don't like conflict and things like that, and I don't necessarily like it either, but if it's making someone uncomfortable, I don't mind telling someone else to stop. And if you don't, you're out. And yeah. sometimes as a DM, you, you have to step into that role. But hopefully, if you're playing with people you care about and you know, you're friends with, that hopefully won't be an issue. Um, I've never really played it like a game shop with random people, so I'm I'm sure it does happen. But it, you know, just communication and you know, don't be a dick. Yeah, and I've and that, as if you're in a if you're in that and a lot of and I've I've seen I've personally seen it a lot of a lot of it ends up being people steering way too much into their character and their character being a dick. Um, and as a DM, that is really, really easy to fix. Uh, if a player is using their character as a, as a, as an outlet to be an asshole, very simple. Put him in a situation that he didn't put him in a situation where he's an asshole to the, uh, he's an asshole to the wrong person. Because he, because uh, the person, because the person he's being an asshole to, has like nine dudes, has like nine dudes spread throughout the entire bar, and he's gonna pick a fight with this one guy, and these guys, and these guys are a fighters guild, where you swing on one of us, you swing on all of us, we're gonna all swing on you. And you bring him down, and you bring him down to, you bring him down to zero, and then you hit him one more time, so that he immediately fails. Uh, if you're playing fifth edition, so he immediately fails two death saving throws to drive that point home, and go one more hit, you're done, like your dude is dead. And yep. now you're part and in a in a low in a lower level game, that party does that party's not gonna have a thousand a thousand gold diamond to bring you guys. And that's the good thing about ending on this topic for us because in the near future we will be doing yet another podcast and we will be delving into the topic of D and D horror stories, both from the points of view of DMs and from the players. So stay tuned for that. But at this point, we are actually finished with our podcast. Is there any final words that y'all would like to say? Miro, we'll start with you. Amaretto cake is good. Good. Knox? Um, 
I like pie. Very fair. Kalum. Uh, be, be a DM so that people like Miro don't have to always be the DM. <laughs> also accurate. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on this episode of Bonus Roundtable. Uh, we, again, will be trying to do this every single week. Uh, we started a little bit later tonight, but our usual schedule is going to be 8 p.m. Central Time uh, every Thursday. So please tune in in the future. We hope you enjoyed. Have a good evening. <laughs>